mix up there. Uh, IBAC's part of the Victorian system of so-called integrity agencies, including the Victorian Ombudsman, um, the Auditor General's Office and the Local Government Inspectorate, um, uh, which is of particular relevance to this audience. Um, our responsibility is for exposing and preventing corrupt conduct. So there's two um, key functions set out in, in the legislation governing IBAC, uh, and one is to identify and expose, which is essentially our investigations, and the other one is to prevent and educate, um, and that goes to um, working with the public sector on the risks and vulnerabilities um, that are out there around corrupt conduct. Um, and we work across the entire Victorian public sector, so it's not just um, uh, state government departments, it's also, of course, local government, and includes the judiciary and parliament, uh, as opposed to some impressions. And somewhat to my surprise, when I started five years ago, I said, oh, how many government agencies are there in Victoria? There's 3,600. Um, anyway, that's quite a few. Our business model is essentially to receive and assess either complaints from the product, uh, from the from the, from the public um, as individuals uh, or notifications from organisations and they don't need to be public sector organisations but in the main that they are. And we do one of three things with a complaint or notification. Um, we either dismiss or refer or take it up for investigation ourselves. And um, um, the vast bulk of matters we dismiss, frankly because they lack substance, um, in the in the in the majority of instances, about a third of matters we refer. Uh, and so where it has some credibility and substance to it, but we don't judge it to be serious or systemic or su sufficiently serious or sufficiently systemic to warrant our own investigation. And we make some other judgments about the capacity of your organisation to actually investigate whether, you, whether or not it would be better suited for us or another agency such as Victoria Police or the LGI, et cetera, to, to take up. Um, so there's a few judgments there but we do refer um, the bulk of matters that have substance to them, and we only take up a tiny amount of matters for investigation ourselves because we're an organisation of 200, of about 60 of which, 60 of whom are investigators, um, and of course we're servicing a very large jurisdiction, so we do restrict ourselves to, um, to quite a small number of investigations. Um, and then our important prevention function as well. We do a lot of strategic, what we call strategic research and intelligence, and that looks at themes and trends in corrupt conduct or police misconduct. Um, uh, for example, in the police jurisdiction, we'll be looking closely this year at instances of um, excessive or alleged excessive use of force by police, and that was in the media last week to, to some considerable degree. Um, and that's an example of a trend or theme that we'll look at in our strategic research. And then we publish reports. Um, uh, and that that's really goes to informing you about the risks and vulnerabilities of corrupt conduct. Um, common corruption risk areas that we see, just, just to highlight again, based on both our investigations and our research over our relatively short life to date of five years, procurement, you know, it's a pretty obvious one, um, but it is a key risk for, for any government agency that spends any money. Um, and examples include conflict of interest, inadequate due diligence, contract splitting, inadequate governance of the process, um, and Operation Fitzroy, uh, which looked at um, um, uh, transport, Public Transport Victoria, this is three or four years ago now, and that was a classic case of middle management procurement fraud. Um, and those two employer, former employees of PTV have now been sentenced to terms of imprisonment and um, repaying a combined total of six, 3.6 million in restitution to the state. Um, so that's, that's, quite an uh, that's been quite an important case for us. Um, information and data security is, is another um, key area. Examples include unauthorised access to data sets, um, unauthorised disclosure of public sector information, um, and particularly in agencies with access to sensitive or classified information. But it's not just the agencies you might typically think of. Vic Roads, for example, holds a lot of data that, that includes people's private details. And so the leaking of, this is a hypothetical case, um, the leaking, uh, but it's been commonplace in other jurisdictions where, for example, 
the license plates, details of unmarked police cars are leaked to, you know, um, uh, organised crime um, figures, that kind of thing. And then you start to think about councils and the kind of information held at councils and your own vulnerabilities to the disclosure or unauthorised leak leaking of that information. Recruitment, this is another one that we've picked up on, people management and recruitment. Nepotism, inadequate probity checks, employment recycling, which where people who come under a cloud resurface, uh, resign, resurface in another organisation in a similar role within a short period of time, and none of the risks around their own conduct um, have been addressed in, 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 that, in that time. So that's, that's, that's emerged as a clear theme and trend for us. Um, we had an Operation Exmouth a couple of years ago, looked at allegations in places of Victoria, which is no longer exists, but um, uh, contracts awarded to work entities with whom there was a, a family relationship. Um, and we found that the perpetrators had a history of misconduct in other workplaces, inadequate probity checks that, that meant that that hadn't been identified. So there was a history there that should have been identified due through any due diligence process and wasn't. Um, conflict of interest, um, when not declared openly or managed consistently, and this is, this is a strong theme across local government, um, uh, conflict of interest arises. It's not the conflict itself, but it's management, which is the issue. Um, conflicts, of course, arise all the time. It's the manner in which they're managed, uh, which, is, um, which brings um, conduct into question. Um, accepting gifts and benefits, um, favourable decisions, participating in secondary employment um, that conflicts with primary employment, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we see that as a, a clear trend and theme. Um, we investigated the Department of Education, as most of you are probably aware, um, uh, resulting in public examinations in 2014 and 15, um, and a conflict of interest there at very senior levels of the department, reflecting a, a some, some, some clear cultural issues in the organisation were, were at play and, and they contributed to then actual um, uh, misconduct in the form of prescribed offences occurring. Criminal associations is another one that's, um, that's emerged for us and relates to the threat of organised crime, organised that cultivate contacts within the public sector and this extends to local government as much as it does other agencies and it's often for the use of extracting information. Um, debt collection. Um, the whereabouts, names and addresses. That's a basic one, for example. Um, and, um, and we're seeing that trend um, continuing all the time, especially where organised crime, for example, will target a regional town around, um, you know, the trade uh, in uh, illicit substances, methamphetamine, etc. And um, local government employees will be a clear part of their targeting um, of local... Um, local figures, people with um, with access and influence in in um, in the period, and often for the purposes of compromise. So we've had an example of where a local government employee was targeted because she was the sister of a police officer, um, and then compromised subsequently the police officer um, uh, into not investigating or not following up matter matter up. Um, regulatory functions, of course, um, being corruptly used for personal gain is, um, is a persistent theme as well. And, and examples include issuing and collecting payment for permits and licences, kickbacks, etc., cetera, um, and enforcing regulations and compliance with legislation in a way that's, that attracts a certain payment. Um, that's, that's a regular occurrence um, and something that controls and, and procedures need to be built around to, to prevent. Um, you'll be aware of... Uh, the next slide, which says mandatory notifications. Over a year ago, 15 or 16 months ago now, um, the legislative amendments came into effect which require you as CEOs, those of you who are CEOs of, of local government, to report suspected corrupt conduct to IBAC. Um, there's no element of discretion. Um, uh, the obligation is upon the princ relevant principal officer, as it's termed in the legislation, which is in the case of local government CEOs, to notify IBAC when they reasonably suspect corrupt conduct to have occurred. That raises a number of issues. What's corrupt conduct? And when is that threshold of reasonable suspicion reached? Um, and that's a constant question that I get. 
And should it arise for you, we just invite you to, to call me. We do have um, directions on our website which set out broad guidance to what that obligation means for you. Um, uh, and it also makes clear that the obligation is yours and that we are constrained somewhat in being able to advise you. So if you're in doubt, you really need to seek some form of independent advice, reach and form your own judgement and make a call about whether or not a matter is notifiable to IBAC. Um, for the 12 months to December last year, we received just 100 notifications under the mandatory regime, which when you think about the 3,600 organisations I was referring to earlier and the extent of corrupt conduct that we are seeing, it's not a massive problem in Victoria, but it's not, it's not an insignificant problem either, then that suggests that there's significant under-reporting against that obligation, especially compared to our to very similar jurisdictions in Queensland and New South Wales, and we've worked quite closely with our counterpart agencies there, who have had mandatory notifications in place for 20 years or more, and have built up those systems in those states. Um, so we have a pretty good picture of what we probably should be getting, and we're not. Um, finally, um, if I can just, yep. Um, we're currently conducting another review into local government integrity frameworks um, as an update to a review that we conducted in 2015 and published back then. Um, the purpose of the review is to just identify good practice and opportunities for improvement. It's not, to, uh, it's not a gotcha moment or gotcha exercise. Um, it really is identifying good practice and opportunities for improvement that can be leveraged across the local government sector. Um, there's been really great participation from the six or eight, I can't remember now, sorry, councils involved, and I thank those councils for their assistance. Um, we'll be releasing a report later in the year, having gone through uh, drafts and sharing those drafts with councils and, and getting their responses, and they'll detail, that report will detail our findings and recommendations and really do encourage you to look out for it. Um, just as a note um, at the end, um, we have been conducting what we call regional forums together with um, the Auditor General's office and the other agencies in the integrity um, field, if you like, for want of a better term. Um, uh, and we've, our most recent one was in Warrnambool. Our next one will be in Tarragon next Friday, actually. Um, and so we really encourage um, participation and, um, at those regional fora, um, and the next one sort of being in, in Gippsland, and the one subsequent to that, oh, I did just remember, but um, we've done one in Wang, um, Warrnambool, Mildura, Tarragon's next, and um, you know, watch this space, we'll announce where that one after, but we plan to do them once every you know, four or five months or so, and they're a good way of bringing um, local government, state, gov state government um, representatives from, the, from within those regions. Uh, and other entities um, um, together to talk about what we do and, and how we can assist and, and spread the message, if you like, about corruption risks and vulnerabilities. Other than that, I'm more than happy to, to take any questions. There's our contact details, should you wish to um, contact us or, or, or identify, um, you know, see our website, etc., or indeed to pass on a notification or complaint to us. Um, but thank you very much.